going to go ahead and go over the Unit 1, Lesson 1, Scientific Knowledge Lesson Review. So you're going to go ahead and take out this page, it's page 15. So pull out page number 15. You're going to check over your answers. Again, if you got anything wrong, you can go ahead and make the corrections. There's also going to be page numbers where you can find the answers. So make sure you get these down. If you get anything down, get these down. That way you can go back and look in the text. And if you don't have a chance to write down all the answers or only get part of the answer written down, you can go back in your text and find what page I found the answer on or I came up with the answer, I generated the answer. And so the first one, the first one's scientific law or scientific theory. And a scientific law or theory is an explanation for how something occurs. It is supported by a great deal of evidence. So since it's an explanation, it should have had theory. And we'll go ahead and take a look at that page number. And so that was on page number seven. So we'll flip to page seven. And this one says, what does science tell us? And you have to underline what a theory is in science. That was the active reading assignment. So you should have underlined the scientific theory is an explanation so supported by a large amount of evidence. Theories are what most scientists agree to be the best explanation based upon what we know. So that shows you the correct answer for that one. And now we're going to go back to number two. Scientists look for empirical evidence or a law, either in the field or in the laboratory. So what are they looking for in the field or in the laboratory? A law is a description, so they're not looking for that. That's what's going to describe what's happening. So they're looking for evidence. And that was on page number seven. So flip to page seven. Where do scientists get their evidence? Scientists are curious. They look at everything going on around them and ask questions. They collect any information that might help them answer these questions. And then you have empirical evidence. And then you have to underline the definition of empirical evidence. So you would have been underlining right here. Empirical evidence is all the measurements and data scientists gather in support of a scientific explanation. Scientists get empirical evidence in many different places. Generally, scientific work is categorized as field or laboratory work. So evidence, booyahs, right there. You get it in the field or in the lab work. For instance, you see the lady down here. She is digging up this evidence, great big dinosaur fossil. Right, so you can go to number three. A basic principle that applies a basic principle that applies everywhere. So it's a basic principle that applies everywhere and in all situations is best described as a scientific Again, this is a basic principle that applies everywhere in every instance, in all situations. A ball flying through the air, the apple falling from the tree. And so those are laws. And if we go to page 8, laws describe principles of nature. Scientific law is a description of a specific relationship under given conditions in the natural world. In short, Scientific laws describe the way the world works. They hold anywhere in the universe. You can't escape them. So for the first three, you had theory, evidence, and law. And for number four, it says to list into what three areas are the natural sciences commonly divided? And that's on page number six. So let's go ahead and take a look at page number six again. Okay, so you have right here 
natural sciences are divided into three areas. And those three areas are life science, which you studied last year, earth space science, which you're studying this year, and physics or physical science, which you'll study next year. So we'll flip back. Should add earth space science, life science, and physical science. And you can put the other things if you put um, uh, biology, geology, and physics, that's fine as well. And so again, that was on page number six. And distinguish how is the use of the word theory in science different from its more common use. So you hear people say, I have a theory about this or I have a theory about that, but that's different than a scientific theory. So how is it different than a scientific theory? So we're going to go to page number seven. And on page number seven, it says right here, you may think that what you read in a science book is accepted by everyone is unchanging. This is not always the case. The facts of science are simply the most widely accepted explanations. Scientific knowledge is and probably always will be changing. Okay, commonly, we think of a theory as a guess or a hunch. In science, a theory is much more. A scientific theory is an explanation supported by a large amount of evidence. Theories are what most scientists agree to be the best explanation based upon what we know. So, what does that mean? Well, let's take a look at the question again. Hey, how is the use of the word theory in everyday use different than a scientific theory? Scientific theory is based on evidence. Hey, a theory in everyday use is often just someone's opinion. A scientific theory is an explanation based on lots of evidence. So somebody may have an opinion of this or of that, but they don't have any evidence to back it up. So that, that's a theory, but it's not a scientific theory. Scientific theory is backed up by evidence. And we're going to go down to the next page. Okay, so number six, differentiate. How would you distinguish a scientific theory from a scientific law? So we need to know the difference between a theory and a law. So to get this one, we're going to go to page eight and nine. So page eight slash nine brings us this. What is science and what does science tell us? And so um, it's giving you the definition of a theory right here. A scientific theory is an explanation supported by a large amount of evidence. Theories are what most scientists agree on is the best explanation. And so that's what a theory is. It's an explanation. If we flip to the next page, eight nine, it tells us what a law is, and then also what a theory is. So a scientific law is a description of specific events. So you've got to take this, and you've got to take this. and compare and contrast them. All right, so think of some of the things that can go here for theory. What are some of the things that go here for law? And then they share some things. They both have evidence. And they're, just, they're both telling us something about the natural world. Okay, but a law is a description. So this would go here. And a theory is an explanation. This is a specific single event. Let's see the word specific here. So we're doing this box. 
where this is explains how things happen and helps us understand laws. So you can put understand laws in there. So how do you distinguish the scientific theory from the scientific law? Scientific law describes specific events, while scientific theories explain why those events occur. And number seven, name two methods scientists use to obtain empirical evidence. Let's go ahead and go to page. Page 10, okay. and right down here, scientists get empirical evidence in many different places. Generally, scientific work is categorized as field and lab work. So main two methods scientists use to obtain empirical evidence. So you're going to pick two different methods. So I chose a couple of different ones, and these are just a couple, and you can have any number of them. So one is an archaeologist digging up bones. An archaeologist works out in the field, just like that picture. And she's digging up bones, and that's evidence that she can use to support um, her hypothesis that she may have about dinosaurs and how they lived or what size they were. A student timing another student running. Again, you guys are scientists. You're students, but you're still scientists. And so we wanted to find out the speed of the average person in class. Well, we could go on a track and, uh, and time somebody running, time a bunch of students running the 100-yard dash. And that would be us getting empirical evidence. And so that's number seven. Number eight, what is a difference between research in the field and in the laboratory? So again, we're going to go back to number 11. Ten and 11. And so on page 11, we have in the field, in the laboratory. Again, you're looking for what are the differences here. Okay, well, Generally, gathering empirical evidence outdoors or where conditions cannot be controlled is known as working in the field or field work, giving scientists the opportunity to collect data in the original setting. And biologists and geologists do a lot of field work. And they're not able, really, to do much in the laboratory. So out in the field is where they're going to get their best information. And, um, in the laboratory, scientists have the opportunity to collect data in a controlled environment. Unlike in the field, the laboratory allows scientists to control conditions like temperature, lighting, and even what is in the surrounding air. A laboratory is also where scientists usually do experiments. Again, they want to control as many variables or things that could change as possible. So what is the difference between research in the field and research in the laboratory? Field research allows the scientists to go to the natural source of the observation or what they want to observe. And lab research allows for much better control of environmental conditions. You don't have to worry about the weather. You don't have to worry about the temperature. You can control the environment much better in a laboratory than you can out in the field. And number nine, interpret. As the flames heat the gases in the balloon, the volume of the gases increases at constant pressure. The volume of all gases increases with increasing temperature. Is this statement a scientific theory or law? Explain. So on page eight, go ahead and flip it to page eight and take a look. Okay, again, a scientific law is a description of a specific relationship under given conditions in the natural world. So, what is 
is this talking about? It's talking about the given conditions of the higher balloon. What happens when you apply heat to the balloon? If you increase the heat of the gases, what's it going to do? Well, the volume's going to increase, um, and then the balloon is going to expand. So every time you do that to the balloon, every time you increase the heat, the volume of the gas is going to expand and the balloon is going to go up in the air. So that's a law. It's describing, it's describing something that happens in nature and it will happen every single time. And number 10, defend. Someone tells you that scientific knowledge cannot be changed or modified. How would you answer this statement? So again, you have to defend in, in science a lot. Right? Somebody wants to debate you, so if they're going to debate you, you're going to come with your evidence. So what are you going to tell somebody? And so let's go to page 12. And on page 12, it says, how do scientific ideas change? Is recall that scientific knowledge is agreed upon knowledge. It is what scientists think are the most likely explanations for what we see. Over time, these most likely explanations can change. Sometimes they're very long, or excuse me, very large, but most of the time, it's very small changes. And why do they change? They change because of new evidence. So, let's go back to the question. Somebody is telling you that science doesn't change, the knowledge doesn't change, it always stays the same. Well, you can point to any number of things. Any scientific knowledge changes all the time when new evidence causes it to. For instance, if it didn't change, we would still believe that the Earth is flat. Because when we look out and we see the ocean, and just that like in past times, they would see um, a ship, and a ship would go to the edge of the horizon, and then it would disappear. Now they thought that the ship would just fall off the edge of the Earth because the Earth was flat. But we know now, obviously, that the Earth is not flat. But why do we know that? We know that because our observation, our power of observation changed. We got telescopes and we were able to um, travel around the ocean and we didn't fall off when they came back and um, they were able to provide that information or that evidence. So scientific knowledge changes all the time, okay? and mostly in small ways, but it can also have huge changes that I know about if um, new evidence causes it to. And then the last one, conclude. Okay? Each year, the American Chemical Society holds national meetings and many regional meetings for chemists. Reports of these meetings are then circulated. So they'll, they'll all get together, they'll talk, They'll share information, they'll come up with reports of information, and then they'll send that information all around the world via the internet to people that couldn't come to the different meetings. Hey, why do you think this has become standard practice? So why, why do they do this? Why do they even bother to hold meetings or, um, or send out this information? And so now we're going to look on page 13. And 13. Talks about collaboration and debate. And here's the key thing here. Most scientists do not work in isolation. And you may see movies about mad scientists or the pictures of the mad scientists in his basement, like Frankenstein, uh, the scientist who created Frankenstein, you know, and um, they're doing their things on their own, solo. That's not really how science works. They collaborate and share ideas. In a way, all scientists are trying to solve a puzzle. Often, many brains are better than one when solving a puzzle. So, they communicate, share information. The conference allows chemists from all around the world to share information, debate, and this further scientific knowledge. If they all stayed home and worked in labs, the information wouldn't be heard by anyone else. Right? So the information would be shared, and nobody would ever be able to build upon any of 
that information. If you just take it to your grave with you and you don't share it with anybody else, it hasn't really done anybody any good except for maybe you. And you really can't have a very large effect. You can have a small effect, but you can't have as large of an effect if that, as if that information got out to a whole bunch of people. And for instance, if you were to, um, by some way, be able to find a cure for cancer in your basement, and what would happen if you didn't share that information with other people? It would be traumatic for, for uh, scientific knowledge and for millions of other people, not just today, but in the future. So we share our knowledge. Okay, so that's the, um, the correct answers. Again, if you didn't get them all written down, at least make sure that you have the page numbers written down. That way you can go back and you can find this information on the pages. Each and every one of you is able to do that if you just take a little bit of time and go back and look for them. Right, so please don't leave anything blank. If you want to have all these things filled in with the best answers that you can come up with. Okay.